Hi there, this is Colin McGarry with Walking D-Day. Today we're at Dead Man's Corner and saint Clôme de mont Now the junction that became known as Dead Man's Corner was vital for both sides. The 709th Division was manning the eastern coast of the Sherbrooke Peninsula, which was going to include Utah Beach. Further inland, the 91st Air Landing Division were guarding the main road, the N13. Now the 3rd Battalion was responsible from Dead Man's Corner here, saint côme de mont into Carentan. To the south and the southwest were the six Falschmäger or the German paratroopers. Now Carentan, which is just down there, was the key to joining up between Utah Beach over there and Omar Beach. And this junction, which joined the road from Semeriglise to Carentan and the road from Utah Beach was the key to getting into Carentan. Colonel Wolverton was the commander of the 3rd Battalion. Their objective was the bridges at Brevon, which is about three miles over there. And the drop zone was about a mile over there. But he was dropped near here, missed drop like many men and he never even touched the ground. He got caught up in an apple tree and the Germans shot him and then used his body for targets. Now this memorial was put up to him in this place not far from where he actually landed. Now another man who was misdropped was Joe Bailey. In Bailey's plane, McKnight jumped first and the plane was emptied in around 10 seconds. Joe realised he was heading for a steeple. He also realised this must be saint Combe du mont which was only just a mile from their drop zone and three miles from their objective, the bridges at Brevand. He let his leg bag go and it hit the roof like a wrecking ball. Two seconds later, he hit the roof and slid down to the eaves, stopped by his fingernails. He slithered down the buttress on the side of the church. There were two snipers up the bell tower, but Joe ignored them as he had to get to the bridges. He crawled through the graves, then had to vault over a wall. Nobody fired at him. He had to get out of town fast. The hedgerows were impenetrable, so the only way to move was along lanes. He would hear German machine gun fire, and turn away from it. Every half hour he turned on the radio and went through the frequencies. Nothing. He found that he turned back to St. Combe. He tried the radio once more, then realising that he was alone, he smashed the radio and buried it. It would have been a valuable prize if the Germans had got it. Joe was radio and a demolition man. He now knew he wouldn't be at the bridges soon, but he remembered from the briefing that there was a transformer in the village. He cased the town and found it just as described. The information had come from the resistance. He noticed a group of vehicles. Crawling closer, he took his knife and slashed all the tyres he could. Now he approached the transformer and placed one block of nitro on each side with a 40 second fuse. They moved away. They went off together with a muffled boom. Some Germans came down the main road and stopped. Joe got two grenades and pulled the pins out. One he tossed high into the air towards the group and the other he rolled down the road. He got away as fast as he could. During D-Day, he moved this way and that, checking his compass. Then he poked his head through a hedge. He heard a rustle. He clicked his cricket. There was a shout, and hock! He was taken to a compound next to a farmhouse where there were many hundred first men being closely guarded and the wounded men less closely guarded. He found Major Kent was treating Americans and Germans. He'd let himself be captured to stay with wounded men. 
The Germans called him Herr Major Doctor. Joe was allowed to go into the yard to relieve himself and saw the body of Colonel Wolverton hanging in an apple tree. He'd never reached the ground. The walking POWs were now moved again to the south of St. Comte de Mont to the HQ of the 6th Falschemega. The building is now called Dead Man's Corner. They were taken one by one into an underground bunker to be interrogated. He just replied to questions with his name and serial number. His interrogator knew he was from the 101st, but Joe wouldn't confirm or say anything more. As night fell, on the 7th, the POWs moved again along the causeway to Carenton. I've made a video about Joe Bailey, the saga, and the link is just here. He ended up fighting with the Russians against the Germans. Now on the morning of the 6th, Colonel van der Heidt and another officer, they go up the church tower and from there they can see the invasion on Utah Beach. They decide to send troops towards the beach to clear the right flank of the 709th. The 1st Battalion moves towards the Mary Dumont, but the 506 paratroopers are moving into Verville. On the 7th, the 1st Battalion is forced to cross the marshes and they get fired on from both sides and then stopped at Hell's Corner by Johnson and his men. The 2nd Battalion, 6th Falschemega, they set up a defence line at the Druries, which is here, and the 2nd Battalion, 501st, were attacking the Germans here. And this fighting carried on for several days. The defence line of the Germans, the Druries. Now Donald Burgett wrote the book Curahay. Very good book to read. There's a link in the description. He landed uh, over 12 miles from where he should have been. But on the 7th he ended up here with other members of his company. He was in A Company 506. And they were involved in fighting here near the Drury's. The Drury's is over there. Now when the fighting they were involved in died down, they were ordered to line up in two columns in the middle of the road. And the men were grumbling that this is a stupid idea. And sure enough, as soon as they were all formed up, some Germans fired on them. So the paratroopers burst through the hedges to attack the Germans. So Burgett finds himself running across field after field with four other men and a machine gun. And then they get to a hedge and they flop down to have a rest. And then they notice there's Germans coming from behind where they've come from, but they further up the field. The Germans are leaving the field further up. So Hagenbach and Birgit, they take the machine gun into the middle of the road and they're firing at the Germans crossing the road further up. Now they're into the third belt of machine gun bullets and then Hagenbach gets a bullet in the head. So Birgit scoops up the machine gun, scrambles up the hedge, back into the field. Then they realise there's many more Germans the other side of the road than they are. And Trotter is running up and down the hedge, firing from different places to make the Germans think there are more of them than there are. And then a Stuart tank comes across the field and they tell him what's happening. And the tank does the same thing. It fires from one position and then another. And then when it's out of ammunition, it leaves the field and goes onto the road and then it gets hit. So for Birgit, the Dead Man's Corner tank was the tank that helped them. Now there's a few problems with his account. One is he says that once uh, Hagenbach was hit, he took the machine gun and scrambled up the hedge into the field. Now here the road is higher than the field. And the other thing is that the in Burgett's account, the tank left the field and went northwards and the tank of the dead man 
was coming southwards. So there's a problem there. Now it's more probable that Birgit was in this field, which is above Dead Man's Corner. Dead Man's Corner is behind us there. And this fits in more with the account that he gave. Now here the hedge is a lot higher than the road. And he said he scrambled up it with a machine gun. So they might well have been here, firing on the road, with the Germans coming out the field further up. And then the tank would have come from Verville, the other side, and come into the field the other side of this, uh, this field from the road, from Verville. And then once it ran out of ammunition, it would have come out this gateway, there's no gate, there's an entry, and gone up the road towards St. Combe. And there was a tank reported being hit at St. Combe, but there's no photo of it. Now when Don came back in 2007, he still maintained that where he was was below Dead Man's Corner down there. But then when he was shown this field and this bank, then he accepted that this actually fits what he recounted and it must have been here. Now the 746th Armoured was set to accompany the 101st, so they approached Verville. Then the 70th Armoured Battalion took over with Stuarts. Now just up here is the junction with the new uh, N13 four lane highway and in 1944 there was a junction there and this lay-by was part of the road that came through saint Combe de mont It made a kink here and then it went straight across there towards Verville. And the junction had six roads coming off it. So it's quite an important junction. There was a road going directly to saint Combe de mont Of course a road going to Cherbourg. A road going to Carentin. A road going to Verville and a road going to Les Druerides. So it was an uh, important junction and it was dangerously well defended. So Stuart's advanced towards the junction and one was actually hit at the junction and two managed to get through and then one went into the field where Birgit was down there and the other one carried on and was hit just by the house which was the A station for the uh, German paratroopers. Many report the dead man in the tank as Lieutenant Anderson, but he was in number 17, he was in a commander, and he was killed on the 7th, but that happened a mile north of saint Combe de mont Now the tank here was number 12. Two of the crew were D. Curry and Anti Tomaszewski. Now the driver was probably D. Curry and uh, the man who fired the Panzerfaust would have been about here and you can see by the hole in the tank it went into the tank just at the level of the driver's head. Now it's not easy to get a body out of a tank through a hatch which is why the body was left there perhaps for five days. Now the German who fired the Panzerfaust was Obergefreiter Fischer and he would have been just about here. Now in the field where Don Birgit was, some more A Company men arrived and they told him that to go back to Beaumont. That's more or less where they started from. The final attack on saint Combe de mont was launched on the 8th of June. It became known as a snafu engagement if you don't know that expression, it means situation normal or fouled up or something a bit like fouled. Now the plan was simple but of course the execution of it wasn't. Lieutenant Colonel Yule was to lead the 3rd Battalion 501st 
in a direct attack into saint côme de mont Now on their right, which is that way, there'd be two battalions of the 506. Then on their left, that way, the 401st Glider Regiment was arriving from Utah Beach. And they came in by boat, not glider. Now the problem started with the 401st just arriving, or not even arriving, before the launch whistle was blown. And companies A and D of the 506, they were the ones who had been at Dead Man's Corner on the 7th, they were late to the start line, so they didn't get the proper orders. And the rest of the men were exhausted. The units were crossing their paths or trying to use the same road at the same time. Everybody except A and D Company of the 506, this was new terrain they hadn't seen before. So that added to the confusion. Now as SLA Marshall put in his book, what was supposed to be a hammer blow against saint Combe du mont turned into a blow with a wooden mallet that has been a bit damaged and that the glue was still sticky. And on top of that, the 401st arrived in late at the start line and then they were attacked by the Germans at the Druiris. Uwil was supposed to attack directly to saint Combe du mont but this road from Verville towards Demans Corner was sunken between two hedges. So it offered us some protection and the men gravitated towards it, so you followed them. Now A and D Company of the 506, they'd been at Dead Man's Corner on the 7th, and so instead of going to where they should have gone, they went back to Dead Man's Corner. The 401st men ended up on the same road as Ewell's men, and uh, Ewell said to Captain Howell, this, this cow track's not wide enough for the whole damn army. Now the American artillery had fired on designated targets in and around saint Combe de mont and then they were supposed to lay down a rolling barrage in front of the paratroopers as they advanced. And sometimes the barrage got too close to them and then sometimes it jumped ahead. Now the German artillery were also busy firing at the paratroopers and at one point it brought the advance to a standstill. When Newell got to Dead Man's Corner he saw German wagons pulling out of St Combe westwards. He decided to take his men to block the causeway as an escape or stop reinforcements coming in. Now they were fired on by machine guns in houses by the Douve. There's also an 88mm fire coming from Carentin. He decided to pull back to Dead Man's Corner. Ewell's men were the only thing stopping the Germans escaping across the causeway. So they mounted several counter-attacks against Ewell. This started at 9.30 and continued till 3 p.m. and it finished thanks to the intervention of some light tanks. The only option for the Germans now was to pull out westwards. The Germans first pulled into the farm of Rue Marie, west of saint Combe, and then across the marshes and railway line to Carentin. Now the second bridge along the causeway had been blown up at 2pm by the Germans. Now it was blown up against the orders of Colonel von der Heidt. Now he'd given orders for explosives to be put on the bridge, but he also said it shouldn't be blown up without express orders from him. Now just after he left the bridge, it was blown up with a loud boom. And it was Gunnerman, the German, who blew it up. And that was the bridge that the Americans had been trying to get to, to blow up. Donald Burgett now recounts that they had a few days rest while the attack on Carron Town was being planned. Now the attack on Carentin actually started in the evening of the 9th, led by Lieutenant Colonel Cole, and that was the subject of a video I've already made, and the link 
is just here. Hope you've learned something useful from this video. If you're not already, you can subscribe by ticking on the link subscribe plus the bell to be notified of new videos. You can help the channel by clicking the like, making comments, sharing the video, or even by Patreon or PayPal me. There's links in the description. See you soon.